actually, Lindsay, will you go ahead and pull up the image of today's work? It's Tennessee Williams' Midnight Show. And point of view uh, is quite important with this work. So we're gonna be thinking of, about point of view. And so this session is less about you know, me answering questions or giving uh, interpretation or anything like that, uh, or going through every detail of Tennessee Williams' intentions with this work, and more about just having a conversation with each other about um, what we see and what we experience with the work. Um, so I know, so some of you are familiar faces um, and some of you I have not met, um, but of course I've always depended on the kindness of strangers. So we don't need to rest on formalities. Um, you can feel free to just unmute yourself and jump in uh, into the conversation whenever the spirit moves you. But we're just gonna start by looking at this together, looking at this work together, this painting. Um, it's about uh, 30 by 24 inches approximately, just so you know the size. And so we'll just take a minute. I'll stop talking now. We'll look at it together silently. And then I'll jump in with a question. So how would you describe this image? What do you see? It's someone on a stage and we're looking from backstage. Mm -hmm. Good, what else? There's a spotlight, or what looks like it could be a spotlight on the figure. Yeah, do people see that? It's a kind of a circle um, on the stage um, and the figure is standing within it. And Lindsay is identifying that as a spotlight. Um, how would you describe the spotlight? Anyone? from above, it looks like. Generally, when I've been on stage, the spotlight's bright. You don't wanna look like right at it when you're on stage. Yeah. And how is the spotlight depicted in this image? I guess another way of phrasing that would be, um, how do we know it's a spotlight? Because it's on a stage and because the, it's, a, it's lighting up a figure and everyone else we can see doesn't seem to be lit up. Yeah, yeah, good. So it seems to be this kind of, um, these uh, set of shapes that sets this figure apart from these kind of sketch figures in the audience. Um, I, I mentioned this circle on the stage uh, but there's also, and Lindsay's helping me out with the pointer there, uh, but there's also um, what appear to be slightly diagonal lines coming down from the top uh, of the frame uh, that seem to be demarcating that circle on the stage. Yeah. Uh, what else do you notice? What else do you see? An audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Say more about the audience. How would, how would we describe the audience? Well, they're suggested Rather, we don't see much detail about them. Yeah, 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 sort of sketchy figures. Oh, um, Maple in the chat says there's buzzing. Um, uh, can we mute if not talking? All the teachers, lots of dialogue back and forth. Yes, if you're not talking, feel free to mute um, if that's, uh, if, the if there's buzzing that's bothering you. I'm not sure what that might be. Um, turning again to the image, um, we've picked out the audience, we've picked out uh, the spotlight. What else do you notice? Um, how would you describe the colors? Sort of pastel, felt somewhat muted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Sort of pastel. This is done in oil, um, but these primary colors uh, I've noticed just uh, in a lot of Williams paintings, um, red, shades of red, shades of blue, shades of yellow uh, appear again and again. He uses these, these primary colors. Let's turn now to the figure in the center of the stage. How would you describe the figure? Seems to be a naked man. <laughs> Great. Yeah, <laughs> say more about that. Let's describe him. Let's, yeah. What details do you notice about him? He's looking to the, to the left. Um, his body's kind of turned towards the left. Mm -hmm. Or the audience is right. 
Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So the audience sees him from the front, sees his front. Um, he's oriented kind of this way um, with his hand on his hip, um, but we could see his face in profile. So it's kind of an interesting way that he's standing. Uh, good. Um, what else do you notice about him? What else do you see um, about the figure? He seems to have a, a necklace or something around, at least across his back and presumably goes all the way around. Yeah, yeah, let's focus on that a little bit. Um, uh, he appears to be wearing something um, uh, around his neck. Uh, what associations do people have with um, items or articles that look like that? What sort of person might wear something like that? It's, I think it's more about the gest the, the jester, J-E-S-T-E-R, which this was not the only painting of a jester that he did. There's another one at the University of Texas collection, but it's about, for me, but I, I have known it, um, it's about human vulnerability mm. and his exposure on stage and the, the yellow color of, um, what yellow symbolizes of fear, and I, you know, that, that's what I see. That that's what I saw in the painting. Yeah, yeah, great. Let's. This is excellent. Um, there's so much in what you've just given us. So um, first, you pointed out that this necklace that Tim uh, described uh, is some sort of. It's associated with the jester, uh, and you're right. Yeah, um, that that um, Williams uh, has used this jester. Uh, motif before. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with the history of jesters um, uh, or harlequins as they were also known, um, they were really a, a quite early figure within professional theater. Um, uh, you can think of the, the jester or har harlequin as um, the earliest pantomimers um, in uh, the um, professional art form Commedia dell'arte uh, in Italy, the earliest uh, form of professional theater. So this really kind of uh, barely sketched um, uh, piece of uh, necklace or, or lining or collar around this figure, in fact, has these, uh, all of these sort of symbolic resonances. Um, Carol, I wanna come back to what you said about vulnerability in just a moment, but right now I wanna stick with this figure and the idea of the jester. Um, what associations do people have with jesters? Uh, or what springs to mind when you think of the jester in plays you may have seen before, or the fool? They're, they're allowed to sort of speak truth to power or something. They, they, they're, they're allowed to make fun of the king, as it were. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what I thought of, Tim, when I, when I saw this, thinking about the jester, the fool. Uh, I immediately think of King Lear's fool, um, who's the only figure in the play who actually uh, uh, says what he means to, to King Lear, except for Cordelia, um, who speaks the truth, even if it's a little bit opaque or, uh, or um, sort of uh, shrouded in wit or humor. Um, so we can think about this jester uh, as having an association with theater and also an association with a certain way of communicating uh, and a certain way with uh, communicating um, truth or experience. Um, now, jesters, as I mentioned there, uh, I don't think I mentioned, they're typically depicted with um, tights or in uh, sort of diamond pattern clothing um, with a collar sort of uh, like the one that you see in this image. But how has Williams depicted his jester? Not a trick question. Yep. <laughs> so naked, yeah, um, uh, or nude, um, straddling, straddling the line of naked and nude in this image. Um, so, uh, you know, thinking about how he's depicted as jester, um, we can maybe think about the why uh, uh, in a moment, but for now, I want us to think about the point of view. I mentioned point of view. Uh, at the beginning of the conversation. Um, what's the perspective in this image? What's the point of view? From backstage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, one way is uh, maybe where there's an imaginary 
uh, viewer who's looking from backstage, what are other ways of thinking about perspective or point of view? And I'm not sure if, um, if Maple is still having trouble with audio or maybe Luann or Jennifer, if you're having any trouble with audio, just let me know. I don't think, I don't think we, we caught that. Um, um, but just thinking about perspective and point of view, you know, there's an imagined person looking from back, backstage, but there is also the viewer in the museum. Um, I've had the opportunity just to see this work in person. Uh, and also, you know, the Ackland uh, is reopened by on an appointment basis now, so you can see this in person. Um, but kind of what the point of view does is that it puts the viewer in that backstage, backstage position. It, it puts the viewer in that backstage space. Um, <laughs> great, we got that too. Um, so uh, in thinking about um, the identification of the viewer, with um, the backstage person. Um, we can also think about how the audience views the figure. Is there any evidence of the audience's reaction towards this figure? It, to me, they're too sketchy to see something like a reaction. They're just kind of almost like token figures mm. so that I can't see something as, as individual as a reaction. They're just figures looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, like seem like sketches, seem to lack the detail of that central figure. Ah, um, Maple says um, they might be laughing or not. And then asked, did they have strip shows then? Um, it's a great question. So uh, this, the, the tentative date on this is, this painting is um, late 1970s to early 1980s. And Williams's career by that point um, was very much on the decline. The last hit he had had uh, on Broadway was 1955's Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. Um, so he really upped um, his production of paintings in the 70s and 80s. Um, but with that, uh, just stepping back, dialing back on your question, Maple, um, I wonder why you asked the question, did they have strip shows then? What makes you ask that question? Um, I didn't catch that <laughs> little garble, um, but um, you know, one reason, uh, we might think about the association of strip show with this image um, is maybe the text, the title, Midnight Show, um, the kind of the uh, text at the bottom, and also the fact that um, the figure is naked. Uh, maybe we, we might return again to what Carol uh, brought up before, the idea of vulnerability. Um, Maple said it looks old, uh, the image. Um, so there is a kind of vulnerability to this figure and also a kind of absurdity if we are thinking of this figure um, as a jester. Um, but, uh, you know, the viewer of the painting um, is in a way themselves identified um, with that onstage figure. Uh, the viewer is also being looked at by the audience based on the point of view. So the audience can see the figure on the stage and see through the curtains to the, to the, um, to the figure backstage, also the viewer. So there's a sense of identification between that onstage figure and the person backstage. Um, so further associations with the title. I brought up this title, Midnight Show. What asso other associations do you have with the title? It's okay if not, we can move on. Um, so um, we talked about point of view a little bit. We've talked about uh, the figure on stage, um, but now let's think about the ideas of performance and persona in this image. Um, in an interview, Tennessee Williams said, if you write a character that isn't ambiguous, you are writing a false character, not a true one. Do you see any, any evidence of an ambiguous persona or ambiguity in this image? I feel like the fact you can't see the audience faces kind of echoes to the ambiguity. And then I saw in the chat that Maple said shady time sexual as a relational to, I guess, midnight show. Mm -hmm. So after dark is when the fun happens, maybe. <laughs> um, Mabel also asked for the quote again. So I put it in the chat. If you write a character that isn't ambiguous, you are writing a false character, not a true one. Um, so maybe there's a, a, a sort of... Um, being uncertain about 
uh, the morals of the figure that we're looking at or being certain about the morals of the audience that we're looking at. Um, is this a figure of uh, vulnerability? Is this a figure of empowerment? Is this a figure of exploitation? It's hard to tell. And maybe where we come down on that question depends on how we identify with that figure. Um, other, other evidence, is there any other evidence of, of ambiguity in this figure of an ambiguous persona? Something about the stance with the hand on the hip seems sort of um, almost challenging or something like, um, if I could put words in his mouth, be sort of, okay, yeah, I'm standing here nude, so what? Or something like that. That's so interesting you say that, Tim, yeah. Um, figure sort of standing, um, we might even call this like a contraposto stance, a, a stance that you see a lot in Renaissance art where the figure right. is, is sort of standing relaxed, but also open uh, uh, to display, open to um, performance. Um, and it's interesting that you noticed um, that, uh, that, or you, you um, describe this stance as kind of confrontational. Um, say more about uh, what you see that um, makes you interpret as confrontational? Well, it was partly the stance. Um, someone earlier, I forget who it was, mentioned this possibly being a strip show, mm -hmm. and, and which would go with the midnight show and the naked man. And so I have this notion in my head of people performing strip shows being sort of um, confrontational, um, I can't think of the word, but sort of blatant or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Really open, blatant about it, yeah. Um, great, so, um, you know, also in thinking about this figure, uh, I mentioned, you know, we didn't talk about the pose before, uh, but it is a kind of contraposto stance. Um, th this, this figure uh, is naked, is in a sense on display, is in a sense vulnerable, but um, uh, is also a very masculine sort of figure. Um, mm -hmm. Has a kind of classical build, at least we can see from behind. Um, and one thing we haven't discussed in this conversation is uh, Tennessee Williams' queerness. Um, uh, the fact that he uh, was gay and the fact that the performance of sexuality and the performance of masculinity is something, and femininity as well, is something that comes up quite a bit uh, in his plays. Um, in what way might this figure represent uh, a particular performance of masculinity or said another way, how would you describe the masculinity of this figure? He's muscular, he's well built. Yeah. Probably works out or something. Yeah, yeah. I would also say maybe the fact that he's not looking at the audience, he's looking off to the side. Like, if I did that, that would, I don't know. It's not sassy, is not the right word, but kind of like, yeah, I know I've got an awesome body. Kind of what to what Tim was saying, like, I work out. Can't you see? Yeah. So now we, we've, we're building on or we're building up to a kind of interesting tension. You know, Carol noted um, towards the beginning of our discussion that this figure seems vulnerable, um, that they're naked alone on a stage and that's terrifying. It's almost like a nightmare. It's a bad dream. Uh, and yet now we're coming to a description of this figure as um, sort of confrontational in this re relaxed posed, uh, Rax pose. Um, so it's a figure that's simultaneously vulnerable and defensive, and it's kind of hard to tell um, depending on where you're looking from, where you're seeing from. Um, and we might also put this idea in tension uh, with the primary colors. Um, the simple shapes and sketched forms seem to be presenting 
um, a very simple story, um, but there's quite a lot of complexity just in this, this single figure. Um, this, this body, uh, you know, might be identified with Tennessee Williams, um, but it might be a projection, his persona that's separate from an interior self, or it might be, you know, a means of the audience identifying with a figure like that. There are a lot of different ways of thinking about it. And so one fun activity um, that I thought might be generative for us as we're thinking about this image, uh, would be to try our hand at narrating the scene. Um, how would we narrate a scene like this? How would we think about it as an observer, um, as a playwright? Um, does anyone wanna take a stab? I know Tim, you, uh, you were sort of thinking about how the figure might be speaking the dialogue that they might produce. How might we narrate this scene? Well, I, I was thinking about, if I remember correctly, this late in his career, Tennessee Williams was living in Key West. Is that accurate? Which I don't know if it was true then, but now is certainly very gay identified. So that this could well be a scene in a gay bar or a gay club or something. Yeah, so it's um, very interesting you say that. I'm glad you brought up this point. Um, so Key West is, is identified now um, with the gay community, but uh, in the 70s uh, and 80s, when Williams was living there, he um, was the victim of multiple hate crimes. So he told stories oh. of um, he and his friends being jumped. He told stories of teenagers throwing cans uh, at his house in Key West. Um, so there was a, a kind of ostracism um, that mm. was happening in that community when he lived there. Um, and so we can also think about that um, personal life experience in relationship to an image like this, um, that kind of isolation uh, of being um, sort of what must have felt like at the end uh, or at the declining uh, moment in a brilliant career um, with friends who had died uh, painting. Um, yeah, Carol, go ahead. I'm hoping you would chime in. <laughs> no, the, um, the, you know, Tennessee Williams spent a lot of his life in New Orleans where there were strip shows. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan of his plays as well as when I discovered he had done paintings, I, it, I was, it was very interesting to me because I, I admired him as a, his statements about writing, his theater. And he's, you know, one of the things he's, he said to Edward R. Murrah, who happens to be from North Carolina uh, originally, he said, let us not deny all the dark things of the human heart, but let us try to cast a clear light on them in our work. Mm. And he, what, he did try to be open about the homosexuality. And it was sort of in the early, you know, in, in the uh, Cat on the Hot Tan Roof, they, did, they covered it up quite a bit in order to not expose that. But he's, you know, he was, um, as a writer, if you go back to the Glass Menagerie, when this was an early play, um, he said, Tom's made the statement, yes, I have tricks in my pocket. I have things up my sleeve, but I'm the opposite of a stage magician. He gives you illusion that has the appearance of truth. I give you truth in the pleasant disguise of illusion. Which when I, you know, I, I was familiar with that quote. So I just, it, it meant a lot to me because I'm a visual artist and when I was back in the 50s, nobody, I mean, 60s, when I was studying art, nobody could do anything narrative. Everything was abstract expressionism. And there was nothing about, you know, it, artists always did um, uh, identity work, but not, it wasn't accepted. Like in Tennessee Williams also said, all creative work is autobiographical. Mm -hmm. But I, I just felt so strong about, I haven't owned another painting too, and I actually bought them from um, Antiquarian Bookstore up in Connecticut, <laughs> which, you know, it's kind of an odd thing, a place to find them. But, you know, that there was a, 
prominent collector in in uh, Key West who col who collected his paintings, but he didn't really paint until his later years. And but the same thing comes through from his th from his plays comes through in this to me. I think that's so well put, and thank you so much for those quotes because um, they shed a lot of light uh, on this work. Um, uh, and a particularly your point about uh, his identification with his characters, you know, thinking about the jester, we can think about um, the jester, the, the central figure as perhaps identified with Williams, um, but also thinking about the characters that Williams liked to write. Um, these uh, uh, kind of uh, not caricatures, but certainly um, uh, very um, emotionally um, interesting, <laughs> uh, uh, um, so almost Southern Gothic sort of figures, um, thinking about Blanche Dubois, um, uh, thinking about Maggie, kind of Haunton Rope and Glass, uh, and Laura and uh, Amanda from Glass Menagerie, these um, all women, interestingly, uh, and also um, uh, on the uh, sort of, um, bridging the, what am I trying to say? Um, uh, kind of uh, mentally uh, unstable or um, on the edge of comic and romantic. Um, and he really um, sort of uh, balanced them on this fine line of comic and romantic, um, wanting to, um, Blanche Dubois, for example, wanting to uh, put a paper lantern on the light in order to create a, an air of an enchantment in the Kowalski's ugly New Orleans apartment. Um, that, that bridging the line between the absurd and the sad and the pathetic. Um, so he, he was interested in these characters um, and part of that has to do with his life experience and part of that has to do with who he is. Um, uh, and we can see that sort of absurdity, but also pride and nobility in this, this figure here. Um, great, so any other thoughts that people want to share about this scene, either narrations or projections or observations or responses to, to Carol's quotes? There's another quote going back to what you just said. He said, the feminine sensibility is more usable to me as a writer. I think it is closer to art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, what do we think's behind that? Um, because we were talking about masculinity earlier in relationship to this. Um, so what, mm -hmm. you know, in thinking about um, how gender is depicted in this image, um, uh, you know, what associations um, do we have with how, you know, with gender and how gender is presented here? Well, I really think it was his struggle with his own mother mm. to understand her. And then the effect that her, his mother had on him and his sister. Yeah. His sister, yeah. Uh, his, his sister was um, like a victim of his mother. In fact, you know, she, ordered, she, got, she had a lobotomy done on his sister and that really upset him. But it's just, I think it was, try, it's just the autobiographical part of trying to understand your life yeah. and what happened. And the women were, his mother was a very strong woman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> as like you, I remember reading um, that his mother was sort of a, um, a, a very, um, like, kind of like a, a really strong personality. Uh, and then of course his sister Rose um, uh, had mental issues and, and was lobotomized um, and he was devastated by that. Um, Maple has put in the chat uh, that there were stricter gender behavior expectation lines then. And I think that's right too, that um, you know, Williams identified um, with a certain performance of Southern femininity, um, maybe because of uh, both what was denied women what is denied women, uh, and uh, and also because of um, you know modes of behavior that might not be, have been allowable to men, so that there were ways uh, the codes that um, uh, conformed the behavior of both women and men, and ten, and Williams was very aware of that, and that was part of uh, the sadness and the the pathos uh, 
and also the comic aspects of the character that he drew and the characters that he sketched, both uh, in paint and on the page on, on, within text. Um, other thoughts, other, other ideas or observations? Well, following up on what you just said, um, and thinking someone earlier said, oh shoot, I've forgotten it, sorry. Um, uh, the, no, oh, that he, that in, that his house was vandalized or something like that, what yeah. did you say? In Key West, yeah. Yes, um, and so thinking of him as being sort of defensive, but putting, I mean, this, if this figure is a projection of himself, he's putting himself out there in this naked, this is who I am, like it or not. Yeah. Um, and partly because he's gay, partly because of the gender issues that you just mentioned. He was slightly effeminate in his style, if you've seen him on, mm -hmm. you know, TV clips or something like that. So I wonder if that's at least part of what he's projecting of himself here. That's a very good point, Tim. Thanks for bringing this up. Um, I wanted to mention actually linked on the Ackland's Close Looks page for this object is an interview, a 1977 interview uh, of Williams with um, Dick Cavett. Uh, and it's hilarious for a number of reasons. Um, but one of the things that you get is, it's a long interview, it's like 40 minutes, so you get a sense of uh, Williams's um, persona um, of both his sort of, um, uh, his charm, his humor, the way he carried himself, the way he spoke to people, um, the stories that he told. Uh, and as I was looking at this image and thinking about that interview, watching the interview, um, I found myself wondering, well, okay, how much of this charming uh, incredibly um, gregarious um, person that we're seeing is a persona that he developed as a defense, as a way to exist in the world uh, and, and gain the love that he needed, um, even though uh, how he lived and how he loved um, was outside the norm of the time. Um, so I can't help but think of that, of his own persona and, and mode of presentation. Um, Lindsay, um, say something about the curtain. I noticed you put something about the curtains in the chat. Will you say more about that? Sure. So um, I always have loved the theater, but I am not blessed with acting talent. So in high school, I was the curtain girl um, for all of our productions. And um, the main thing about curtains to me that, you know, they signify the beginning, but they can also hide something because, you know, we have scenery changes, outfit changes when you're going through a performance or a play. And so kind of just along the lines of the authentic self or the layers to personality that, that Tennessee might have communicated if it was an intentional choice having the curtains included rather than than just the figure and audience. Yeah, amazing observation. Um, well, first, what, do any folks have any thoughts about that? About what the curtains are doing in this image? Um, one thing I'll note is that this isn't the first time that um, Williams has used a composition of this type. Um, there's a, another painting from around the same time, 1977, called Le Solitaire. Um, and that's in a private collection, but it was exhibited at the Jewish Museum in 2015. Uh, and it's uh, a single figure, barely sketched, um, with, uh, who's walking down a street and there are buildings, red brick buildings on either side, also just sort of simply sketched. Um, but you're looking at the figure from behind. So it's a similar sort of construction where you have these shapes on either side and then a single figure uh, alone in a space. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting that he returned to that, uh, that type of composition again and again, um, being behind someone, gazing at someone separate from them, um, but also in some way identified with them. Um, we're coming to the close of time. Are there any other last thoughts that people want to share or observations, questions? <laughs> 
I was just going to say, let's also not forget he spent his life in the theater and in a sense, putting himself out there on the stage. Mm -hmm. So there's the issue of his being gay and also out there as, as a playwright. Yeah. And so both of those seem to me could be in this painting. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to mention that earlier, actually, that um, that the, there's the playwright's tool, right, of making the audience empathize in some way with a character or characters, uh, of generating the possibility for empathy or identification with someone other than yourself. Um, so there's that on the one hand, that the playwright is this mediator of connection, but also for Williams, especially playwright as the observer of life, um, someone who has, has to, in a sense, stand back from it and reflect from it a little bit, um, which I think is also kind of an interesting tension uh, uh, that we see in this image. Um, you're apart from the action, and yet you have such incredible access to it uh, and are responsible for it. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts? Well, um, this is always is so fun for me and, and I so appreciate these conversations. Um, and I wanna thank you and I wanna thank Carol also um, um, for sharing her knowledge about this painting with us and also for loaning it to the Ackland. Um, it's an incredible work uh, and, and so profound and, and interesting from a number of different perspectives. So thank you for this. Um, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, Lindsay, are there any final things to say? Um, I would just share from the museum side that, as Aaron mentioned, um, if you are uh, local in North Carolina, the museum's open Wednesday through Saturday, one to five with time ticketing. So should you feel comfortable, please feel free to come out and see this piece in person. Um, it's right inside of Gallery 12. And if not, we have a full slate of virtual programs, including more um, close looks at cocktail hours. And I hope you folks will be able to join us then as we explore other pieces that are on loan and part of the Acklands collection. And thank you so much for spending your time with us this evening. Have a great rest of your week. And stay warm. <laughs> you definitely stay warm. Drink hot cocoa. Can I ask, can I ask one last little question? Oh, sure. How and when the museum acquired this? Oh, actually, this is on loan um, from Carol oh. Levin, who's joining. Oh, right here. <laughs> thank you. Authority. <laughs> it's very, very lovely to see in person. And if you've attended previous close looks, we have a few of those pieces also in Gallery 12 as well, such as the Nelson Morales loans. Um, so I encourage you to get out there. Um, if you feel safe and able, we will be there whenever you're ready. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks thank so you. long. Thank you.